This is Annie of ByAnnie.com and Patterns by Annie. Thank you so much for joining us today for Live with Annie. As usual, we've started the stream a bit early. This helps us get everything set up and broadcasting properly to our various platforms. You can find a countdown clock on the screen showing how long it will be until we actually go live. While you wait, please connect with us and other viewers in the chat. Let us know where you are from and whether you're a new or longtime viewer. We'll see you live soon. again for joining us for Live with Annie. We are so happy to have you with us today. While you wait for the program to start, we hope you'll enjoy the content playing on screen. There's so much inspiration, so take a moment to tell us what you love in the chat. Don't forget there is a countdown clock on the screen so you know how long until we go live.
Hi, it's Annie again reminding you that we'll be going live with this week's episode shortly. There is a countdown clock on the screen showing how much time is left. You've got just enough time to grab some water or a beverage of your choice and a snack and to connect with us in the chat. We'd love to hear what you've been working on this week. It's Annie, back to remind you that we'll be starting this week's live very shortly. We've got a really fun episode planned for today, and we'll see you soon. Hi, I'm Annie of ByAnnie.com and Patterns by Annie. Thank you so much for joining us for Episode 10 of Season 4 of Live with Annie. Today we are going to talk about using fabrics with directional designs or predominant motifs in By Annie patterns. We'll share tips for choosing a pattern, positioning motifs, adjusting project pieces to take advantage of designs, maximizing specialty fabrics, and more. We are so happy to see all of you with us, and thank you for making the time to be here, whether you're joining us live or catching a replay. 
If you enjoy these episodes, please take a minute to follow us wherever you are watching. And if you want know someone else who you think might enjoy the information that we share, we would love it if you'd tell them about Live with Annie. The easiest way to do that is to just tag them while you're watching. That will take them directly to the episode so they can watch it too. Also, we love reading your comments, so please be sure to interact with us throughout this presentation. Tell us what you think about what we're showing, share your tips and tricks, and tell us the projects you're working on. We want to know what you think and we love learning from you too. And be sure to add any questions you might have in the comments or chat and we will do our best to answer them before we close. Last week we talked about options for making Biani projects using either quilted or non-quilted fabric. We discussed the pros and cons of each method and we shared techniques to make quilting quicker and easier, including how to prepare the layers and choose quilting designs, and methods for attaching soft and stable without quilting. If you missed it or want to watch it again, remember that you can find all the previous 146 episodes of Live with Annie on our Facebook page, our YouTube channel, or at byannie.com. We'll put up all the links to make them easy for you to find. So in early February, we issued a two-month challenge. Adapt a Biani pattern by changing the size, the shape, the features, and more. We were really excited to see all the great submissions in the February photo contest and wanted to share some with you today. <coughs> oh, excuse me. <coughs> mm, boy. The top voted winner in the February contest was this beautiful out and about that April made. I loved seeing the beautiful fabrics that April chose and thought her photos really highlighted her story and her adaptations. April's daughter and her husband recently moved to France. Since April's always dreamt of seeing Paris, she and her husband are headed to France in April for a visit. Needing a backpack or purse for the trip, she chose our out and about backpack pattern. April said that she loved the size of it, but knew she wanted to change a few things to make it more personalized and multifunctional. She began by using naked webbing for the straps. In order to be able to use the bag as a crossbody or shoulder bag as well as a backpack, she added a convertible tab with a D-ring at the top and tabs with triangle rings on both sides. That enables her to clip on one strap for a crossbody or two straps for the backpack. I thought that was brilliant. April said that the second strap is easily stored in the mini pockets in the interior so she can change her mind on the fly, which is such a good idea. Next, April used our Diddy Bags 2.0 pattern and leftover scraps to make some small travel bags for toiletries and such. She made a small bag by joining leftover quilted strips using quilt as you go techniques, and the medium bag was constructed as the pattern directed. April was really thrilled to find that the small bag fit perfectly inside the outer compartment and the medium bag fit inside the main compartment. To secure the bags inside, April added two tabs with D-rings and snaps to the inner bag backs. This enables her to snap the bags on or off as needed. April said, now all of my stuff that will go inside the bag has a place to go that will be secure when opening the bag and I can still utilize all the wonderful pockets inside. A total win-win for me. It's the perfect travel trio. So April, have a great trip to France and thank you so much for sharing your story and photos of your awesome travel trio with us. Winning the Storyteller Award in the February photo contest was Patton, who made a beautiful round trip duffel. She adapted the pattern by using patchwork to make the exterior fabric. She did an awesome job of telling the story of her bag in both words and photos. Because Patton and her husband travel a lot, she said she wanted a bag that she could easily carry on the plane, but that could attach to his rolling bag so he could carry it when they didn't want to check their bags. I thought that was a really smart idea. Patton said that she loves quilts and patchwork and that she just picks up fabric as she travels, so she has a great stash. This enabled her to gather all the fabrics for the exterior of the bag from her collection. She wanted a light lining, so she did purchase the polka dot for the interior. 
I really love the block design that Patton used for the front, back, and pockets of the bag, and the rainbow color gradations on the strip piece side strip are really fabulous too. Patton wrote, I'm going to Disneyland with my daughter and grandson in 10 days, and I want it to get it done before then. I made it in plenty of time. I'm flying from Colorado, and they are coming from Tennessee. My plane arrives about 30 minutes before theirs, so I'll be able to put it on their rolling bag when I meet them. Wow, I am sure her daughter and grandson are going to be so impressed with that beautiful, colorful bag. And the Let's Start a Journey tag that Patton attached to the bag is just perfect. I had to laugh at Patton's story about her sewing injury. She wrote, in my excitement of getting close to finishing the binding on the interior, I forgot I had the stiletto in my hand and somehow scratched myself on the chin. I have had sewing injuries in the past from needles to my fingers and such, but never have I injured my face while sewing. Ooh, I can relate. That stiletto has become such an extension of my hand that I often forget it's there too. I'm glad it was just a scratch pattern. Thank you for sharing your story and the photos of your beautiful bag, and I hope you have or had a great trip with your family. That bag is sure to be a hit wherever you go. Michelle brilliantly adapted our stash and dash pattern for her sister who travels a lot and had mentioned that she needed a jewelry pouch. Michelle said, I've made many Biani patterns since starting to sew bags in June 2021 with my first Easy Desert and Peacekeeper. I'm a visual learner, so love the videos that Annie creates. The stash and dash was a challenge as A, there is no video, and B, this was my first time adapting a pattern. I really had to think through which parts would need to be added in sequence to make sure I didn't sew over my internal parts. So true but Michelle did a fabulous job. I really like the section that Michelle made to hold necklaces, with tabs and middle snaps to secure the chain, as well as fold over elastic strips and a mesh pocket at the bottom to keep them in place. She also made earring holders using faux leather, jelly vinyl, and metal snaps, and she said that installing snaps was a first for her. They look great, uh, good job on that. Michelle transferred the knowledge that she gained when making running with scissors to make a separate padded protector to put between the necklaces and earrings. And on that, she added some ribbon so that her sister can slip her daughter's hair clips on it. Good idea. Michelle said, I loved making this. I had the confidence to do it from making the free patterns and from the experience of making multiple other Biani bags. That's really awesome, Michelle, and what a fabulous jewelry case for your sister. I bet she was over the moon when you gave her that. All right, and here is an awesome I'll drink to that that was adapted by Kathy for a novel purpose to carry oxygen tanks. Kathy said, due to pulmonary disease, I have to use supplemental oxygen. The naked tanks are ugly and uncomfortable to carry, so I searched Annie's site for a pattern that might work. It looked like the pattern I'll drink to that would hold one large or two small tanks if I made it just a tiny bit taller. I confirmed with Annie's customer support team that it would work as I described to them. Now that it is finished, it holds a large tank nicely, and as a bonus, it holds three small tanks, not just two. This altered I'll drink to that is so much easier and prettier to carry than those ugly naked tanks. I think the tanks appreciate the nice clothing and the nice padded divider when I carry more than one. The tanks don't clank. I learned that when you alter the pattern, even just adding two inches to the height, you have to figure out all the pieces that will be affected and whether they need to be altered. You have to be especially careful when some directions measure down from the top and others measure up from the bottom. You have to ask yourself, does my adjustment affect this instruction? Having made this minor adjustment, I have a much greater appreciation for how much work must go into creating a pattern starting from scratch and going all the way to the final product. Well, I was really thrilled to see how well those tanks fit into I'll Drink to That, so thank you so much, Kathy, for sharing your photos and your story. And thank you again to everyone who entered this month's contest. I was so impressed with all of the projects submitted and wish we could feature all of them here. 
You will find all the entries on the Biani.com website. Just click on the photo contest slash, slash gallery link that's on the top menu bar and the information we put on the screen can be used for, to search for entries that we talked about. We will have the winner's blog up soon too, so keep your eye out for that. And remember, this is a two-month challenge, so there is still time to submit photos of your adapted bags in March too. So, so far in this series of episodes, we have talked about lots of ways to adapt by any patterns, by changing the design, the size or the shape, the features, or by adding or skipping quilting. Today, I want to share some tips about using specialty fabrics in your Adapted by Annie projects. There are so many amazing fabrics available and it is really fun to showcase them on a by Annie project. So let's what, talk about what you need to consider when you're using a fabric that has a directional design or predominant motifs. So our first consideration when we're looking at a specialty fabric is to decide which pattern would work best to highlight its design. So I've got some fun fabrics here from um, Tula Pink's uh, latest line, Roar, for Free Spirit. So we've got one that's got a nice border on it. We've got one that's got pterodactyls on it. This one's called Gift Wrapped, I believe. And we've got that in a couple of different colorways. So this one we used in several projects, and it's the main one I want to talk about. So go back just a little bit, Glow. So this has a great dinosaur border along each of the long sides of the fabric. And then in between it, it's got this um, more plain kind of meteor. So as we looked at this, we thought that it would be great to use for lots of projects, both large and small. And unfortunately, all of the models that we made with Roar are off at a trunk show or various trunk shows, but we've got photos to share uh, to show some of the ways that we use this print. Actually, I lied. We have one model here. So here is a set of payday bags that we made using Roar. And for this large one, we really wanted to feature these dinosaurs on the front and the back. So when we cut the body of this, we positioned it so that the dino border is what would become the front. So we cut our piece from here up and then the darker part folded around to make the back of the bag. And then we used the meteor shower also for the handles and the straps. And we fussy cut again the, um, the dinosaur print for the back pocket. I talked about that already, Glenn. So here's what you have to keep in mind for this. First of all, when you look at the pattern, this is all one piece of fabric. So you've got to position this so that you know that it's going to fall out in the front. And when we cut this fabric for the back pocket, you have to know that that is one big piece of fabric that folds in half. So when we did that pocket, we cut what we wanted to be on the pocket at the bottom of that piece of fabric, and then the top part was the plain part that went around. That way we didn't waste any of the dinosaur border in spots where they wouldn't be noticed. And by doing the meteor shower here, we didn't have to worry about trying to line up a dino border all the way around. So on the inside of this, we used the gift wrap fabric, which is this one. And I did fussy cut the fabric for the lining on both the wallet and the inner strap. So I started by fussy cutting this piece and um, if you notice here, I pretty much matched this up with it. So if you want to know how to do that, again, first I cut the piece for the wallet lining, and then I followed the pattern to mark the lines where the inner strap would be to pl be placed so I could determine which part of the fabric I wanted to cut to cover that. Then I cut out the strap, but the thing you have to keep in mind with this is you're cutting it two and three quarter inches wide, but it's going to finish it only one inches wide. So what I did is I found the section that I wanted on my fabric, let's say it's this part right here, and I positioned it so that the one inch part was visible right where I wanted it, and then I moved my needle or my ruler up and I cut seven eighths inch above and below that. 7 eighths inch times 2 
is one and three quarters plus the extra one inch that gives me my two and three quarter inch strip so if you're trying to really match designs that's something that you need to keep in mind that not always are you cutting the exact size you've got to figure out how that piece is going to be used and on this bag we fussy cut the gift wrap print for the exterior of the bag and we just used it going all the way up so this is just one piece we didn't do anything special with that so I cut one large piece for the body main making sure that I had it positioned that what I really wanted to see on the front uh, was positioned right there and centered on the on the fabric so I take my ruler and I line it up with whatever half of the measurement is right on the right on the middle of my design and then I cut each side of that. I fussy cut two of the little raptors on the back pocket and though I don't remember planning this I'm really impressed with how this little bit of the design really matches what you see here going all the way across it really flows. I don't think I planned it that way I think that was just serendipity and that worked out. I didn't want to have to also match this outer strip so I just used the meteor shower portion of the fabric for that and then also use that same fabric for the carrying strap. I always like a darker strap anyway, so that actually worked out really good. We always like to make this dark, large slip pocket on the back out of the same, or let me open it on the inside. So we always like to make this pocket out of the same fabric as is on the back of the bag. So when we went to the inside, I cut that pocket and the little zippered pocket in front also out of the gift wrap. Since this pocket is mostly covered, I didn't worry about centering a design there. I just cut what I did, but I did pay careful attention here because this is going to be much more visible to try and center two of the little raptors on that front part. And then I used a totally different fabric in between here again, so I didn't have to try to match that design all three places and a very different fabric for the lining too. So those are just some ways that you can consider using directional fabrics in projects that you're doing or, fa or fabrics that have predominant uh, motifs. Jake's gonna put up a picture of an awesome set of contain yourself bins that we made using the pink colorway of this uh, print with the border. So we fussy cut the border print for the exterior of each of the bins and then we used the coordinating dinosaur eggs for the lining and handles. And I'm gonna grab a bin here that I can show you because it took some careful thought to figure out how to do that. So if you look at the contain yourself large bin, you're going to see that um, on the one that we're picturing, the dinosaurs are right here at the bottom. But if you look at this piece of fabric, when these are made, this is one piece of fabric that wraps all the way around and forms the front, the bottom, the back, and also the sides of the, of the bag. So if we tried to take this dinosaur print and put it on there, there's no fabric at the bottom to do it. So the pattern does give instructions for using a directional fabric as we did here that puts the seam at the bottom, but again, that's not going to do us any good on that print because our border is going to end up at the bottom of the bin if we do that. So what we did on this is we put a seam here, or on the pink one, a seam here and here, added fabric here, and then that's how we, we positioned that that way so that it went all the way around. So that's what we did on the large one. On the medium one, which is here, we again positioned it so that the border print went right along the sides and we filled in a little of the meteor shower at the bottom for that. And then on the small one, it was way too small to get any dinosaurs on, so we just used meteor shower completely for that. So when you're working with really fabrics that have real predominant designs, you really need to consider the scale of the project to see you know, whether they're really going to show up and be worth um, positioning there. All right, so that is um, the dinosaur print in two or three projects. And here's an awesome travel duffel bag that we also made using Roar. And we, I've got to get rid of this fabric. I'll just dump it there. Um, we quilted the gift wrap fabric and the dinosaur eggs fabric together to use for the body of the bag. That enabled us to use the dino egg side for the body. And we only had to fussy cut the gift wrap side for the pockets and trolley sleeve. So I featured the two raptors on the center front pocket 
and then I cut the other two pockets so that the design flows across all three. I also fussy cut the raptors for the side pockets and the trolley sleeve. I couldn't decide what to do for the back pocket, so I tried to pick a portion of the design that made sense with the design that was on the trolley sleeve. Another option would have been to just use the dinosaur egg side for that back pocket, but I felt like we had enough of it on the body already, so I didn't do that. We also used the border print for the pocket on the inside, and hopefully you can see that. Just as we did on the payday bag, you have to read the pattern to figure out how that pocket is made before you cut the piece. So for travel duffel, that pocket is one big piece of fabric and it's folded in half in the middle and the folds put at the top. So when you're cutting that piece out, you want to make sure that the portion that you want to be visible is positioned at the bottom half of that piece. So little tip there. We always quilt a large piece of fabric and we usually use a two yard piece and then we cut the pieces for the project out of that. And um, I have got my leftovers from this, which I thought you might enjoy seeing. So um, when you're fussy cutting for something like this, it does not necessarily make the best use of a piece of fabric. So you can see here where I had to cut out all those little pockets and parts and pieces. So this is what's left over. You know, we're going to do our best to use these to make some smaller projects. And I think, um, you know, I've got some ideas, but if you've got any great ideas, uh, be sure and let us know. I can definitely see some ditty bags or clam ups out of this or um, some of our newer patterns that use smaller pieces. Um, well, when we might make some of those too. These little pieces are the ones that I never know what to do with, but I never throw them away until we're completely done because you never know when you might need a little piece like that for something. I know a lot of people have taken those pieces and joined them to make other projects, so that might be an idea too. All right, here is another travel duffel bag that we made using um, a lovely shot cotton from K Facet. This is a little bit different type of a predominant design or a directional print, but it's definitely directional. And so when I did this, I really paid attention to the stripes as I cut because I wanted those stripes to line up from top to bottom. I didn't want them to be off by a quarter or a half an inch um, anyway. So when I cut this, I made sure that there was a stripe centered right in the middle of my ruler as I cut the pieces for the body. And by keeping that same color of stripes centered as I cut the ends and the pockets, I knew that when I put it together, they would all match. After I had all those pieces cut, I looked to see where the stripes fell out on the sides so that I could make sure on these sides, so that I could make sure that these side pockets also matched. Go, go, go back a little bit. I think you missed something there. One thing that I found really interesting is that the measurements worked out so that the stripes on the side of the body and the ends even match. So I've got like a brown stripe going all the way around. That's just luck of the draw. I, I don't think that was planned at all, but I thought that worked out really well on there. So if you ever decide to use a striped fabric, start by centering your ruler in the middle and everything should work out after that. All right, there are a lot of ways that you can maximize a special fabric to avoid or minimize the Swiss cheese effect that I showed you earlier. So one way is to quilt the pieces for a project individually rather than as one big piece. That way you can fussy cut the fabrics for just the parts that you want and use other fabrics for the remaining pieces. If you want to do that, go to the part of the pattern that directs you what to cut from the quilted fabric and then use those measurements to cut the individual pieces, making sure that you add at least an inch to the height and an inch to the width more if you're doing really big pieces. Then you'll cut pieces to that size from your main fabric, your lining fabric, and your soft and stable. You'll layer those and quilt those together and then cut that designated piece from that piece of quilted fabric. And from there on, you can proceed just as the pattern directs you to do. All right. Here are a couple of Everyday Every Way bags that Elizabeth adapted using Nightshade Deja Vu and De La Luna from Tula Pink. And on each of those bags, Elizabeth changed the front pocket. So this is an Everyday Every Way, and you can see that it has a front pocket with a border on it, and the purpose of that border is to hide a magnet that's attached to the inside. So um, on hers, 
because she didn't want to do that, Elizabeth changed that front pocket from a slip pocket to a zippered pocket. And she fussy cut the motifs for each pocket, adding the fabric that she was using for the body of the bag on each side. So that's another really great way to maximize a specialty fabric. And as you can see, the motif in the De La Luna fabric fit really perfectly on that pocket. For the nightshade version, there's a portion of the frame that around it that's cut off, but the main portion of the lady is on the pocket, so it works really well. If you have a fabric like that, another option you could consider would be maybe to make the pocket taller or larger. But just keep in mind that that would impact the handles here. So what she did there was a much better solution. And as always, before you cut your precious fabrics, we really recommend that you make one bag just as the pattern is designed. That way you will have a much better idea of how things go together and what needs to be changed if you do want to use special fabrics or adapt the design. I gotta have another drink of water. So if you want more information about using specialty fabrics, there's so much more to cover and we just didn't have time to do it all today, but we would suggest that you watch our episode 18 from season three of Live with Annie. In that episode, we featured a number of models that we'd made using Tula's Everglow fabric, and we discussed tips for combining fabrics, fussy cutting, and more. We also shared some tips for fussy cutting in season three episode 33, Introducing Courtside. So that is this bag up here. And the large back pockets on front and back, as well as the trolley sleeve, really offer you some fun opportunities for fussy cutting. So be sure to check out that episode too. All right, it doesn't look like we have any questions today. I hope that you all enjoyed seeing the project that we and others have made using special fabrics and that you picked up some tips to make that process easier. We can't wait to see what you make, so be sure to enter our monthly photo contest, especially if you're doing some special adaptations. And as always, please ask for these patterns and supplies at your local quilt shop. These shops are such an important part of our sewing and quilting community, and it is up to all of us to keep them strong and vibrant. If they don't have these products, they can certainly get them, either from their favorite distributor or directly from us. We're happy to set up wholesale accounts for qualified stores, so just ask them to contact us for more information. We are really proud that one of the sponsors for our annual local quilt shop contest is Shop Hop Inc. And like by Annie, the owners of Shop Hop Inc., Colleen and Jen are on a mission to help keep as many small local quilt shops open as possible. They purchased Shop Hop Inc. from its founder in 2019, and in the years since, they have grown the business significantly, refining their model and boosting hundreds of local quilt shops around the U.S. In 2024, they are expanding to 12 events covering 26 states, and in 2025, they will add three more events covering four additional states. So go to their Facebook page to get details about the various shop hops that are happening around the country. And for a heads up, here's a quick list of upcoming shop hops that are happening now or coming soon. So starting March 1st and through April 1st, 105 shops in Texas have joined to present the All Texas Shop Hop. And during that same time, 75 shops in Florida are presenting the All Florida Shop Hop. And then in April and May, 75 stores in Kansas and Nebraska will have a shop hop across those two states, and 65 shops in Minnesota will host an April-May shop hop. So Biani is really proud to be a sponsor of these shop hops. I know we've got lots of trunk shows out to stores who are participating in them, so be sure to check out all the shops along the way and tell them Annie sent you. Speaking of local quilt shops, our seventh annual local quilt shop contest ended last Thursday. Voting was brisk right up to the end and we ended up with 53,368 votes for 2,248 stores in 13 countries around the world. That's two more countries, 156 more stores, and 14,041 more votes than were in last year's record-breaking contest.
So we are in the process of notifying winners, and we will be making official announcements and sharing information about the grand prize winners on next week's Live with Annie. So be sure to join us then, Wednesday, March 13th, at 2 p.m. to celebrate all those winners. Thank you again for joining us today, and until next week, happy stitching!